Brothers and sisters, good morning. Some young fellows are going to pass out some things to you this morning. We often have uh, sermon handouts available, but I sort of trust you to pick them up this morning. I'm not trusting you. I'm putting them directly in your hands. I want everyone to have one this morning uh, for the message, so you can jot some things down or, or review later. Good to be together. Enjoyed so much our service and how people have led us this morning. So, um, <clears throat> from time to time, it's important for us as a church to step back and do some in-depth Bible study together um, where we sort of take a wider angle, lens, and consider the full breadth of Scripture on a topic, and that's what I am proposing we do this morning and uh, the next few weeks, do this when momentous things are afoot in the kingdom of God, and, and that is the case here at, at Lancaster, and we'll talk more about why that is in coming weeks. I'll just leave that hanging out there. But I do want us to, to think and study together about the ministry of the church. And there we are. Okay. This will involve uh, looking at a lot of scripture together in each lesson. Normally we focus on one passage. I think that's generally the the best way to pursue sermons, but as I said from time to time, we need to, to search a little wider and get a broader view than just one text might give us. And we're going to do that with this idea of the ministry of the church. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus made one of his most important statements, one of his greatest statements, where he said, the greatest among you shall be your servant. The word for servant there is, is one you may have heard before. In the original language, it's diakonos. Sometimes we, we translate that deacon. And it just means one who ministers or serves. It really should apply to every Christian, every member of the church ought to be a servant, ought to be a minister, ought to be a diakonos in that sense. Earlier in the 20th chapter of Matthew, our Lord expands upon this by saying to the disciples in verses 25 through 28 there, he says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we understand that Jesus was ushering in a new kingdom. But it was not going to be a kingdom like any other they had ever experienced or seen or known of. This kingdom was not going to have an earthly king. It was not going to have an exalted ruler who, who ruled with an iron fist. There would be no dictator in this kingdom. There would be no emperor. In fact, Jesus said the great ones in his kingdom would be the greatest servants. They would be ministers, deacons, diakonos. Okay? 
Now when we think about that, we don't want to conclude that the kingdom Jesus was, was bringing was sort of weak and, and pushover kind of thing in comparison to kingdoms with earthly kings and so forth. That's not what we're talking about. And lest we think that, let's go back in time a moment and notice what was said in advance about this kingdom by the prophets. The prophets of old. I want us to go back to one in particular this morning, and that is the, the prophet Daniel. And, and trace um, for a moment or two his prophecy of what we're talking about this morning. You might remember that Daniel was a great interpreter of dreams. Uh, he did this, of course, by the power of God. And, and that he interacted with really some of the greatest worldly wise people in the history of the world. Uh, some of the greatest rulers. Uh, that history still talks about men like Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Darius of Persia. Daniel was right there with them. In Daniel chapter 2, the great Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that troubles him. In fact, it troubles him very much. And he calls all his advisors and all those who were supposedly experts in the field of dreams to help him understand it. There is one caveat, though, about this. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is so troubled by the dream that he has that he doesn't want just the same old hocus-pocus efforts that such people usually rendered when asked um, to do these things. His dream to him was terribly real. He wanted a real answer. And so if someone could really do that, you know, if someone really had the ability to interpret a dream like this king had, they also ought to be able to tell him what the dream was. That's his reasoning at least. So he insists that someone first tell him what the dream was before he ever relays it and then interpret it for him. We can imagine what this set off among his advisors. No one can do that. In fact, they object that uh, no one on earth could do that, that kind of thing. No one had ever been asked to do such a thing. And they say only the gods could do such a thing. This is all in the first 11 verses of Daniel chapter 2. And that response from the so-called experts makes the king furious. And as, as earthly kings often do, as they have power to do, he reacts um, in anger. He is ready to slaughter this entire group of people in Babylon for this failure, their unwillingness to take on this task. They're about all ready to lose their head. But then the man of God, Daniel, arises and he offers to do what supposedly was impossible for any man to do. To tell the king what his dream was first, without ever having heard it, and then to interpret it. Daniel, of course, was no God. He didn't pretend to be God. He didn't pretend to have some special uh, training or power in this thing. He was simply a servant of the Most High God. And he's very clear about that. Daniel and his friends, uh, as a result, they, they, uh, they, they seek God's face in prayer about this thing. And God, in a vision, reveals this dream to, uh, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had had, reveals it to Daniel, 
and, of course, reveals its interpretation. Daniel, in turn, praises God. And there's some wonderful words uh, you may have never heard or, or paid much attention to before. I, I do want us to, to, to hear them this morning in Daniel chapter 2 when God responds to the prayer and, and reveals these things to Daniel and his friends. It's in verses 20 through 23 of, of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He ch changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with Him. To You, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for You have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we ask of You, for You have made known to us the King's matter. Well, very soon after that, Daniel is, is ushered into the presence of the great earthly king. And Nebuchadnezzar asks him if indeed he can tell him his dream and tell him what it means. Now, put yourself in his place. I don't know how you'd respond. I can imagine how I would respond Daniel does not say, oh, yes, I can, king. You know, that, would be my, uh, that would be my tendency there. No, Daniel, Daniel says, it's true what they say, king. No mortal can do what you ask. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and has made known to the king what will be in the latter days. That's Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. Notice how he transfers all credit and glory to God for what's been revealed. And then, very importantly, Daniel says to the king, your dream will reveal what will be in the latter days. Your, king will re your, your dream will reveal what will be in the latter days. That's why we're taking time this morning to talk about this, this story from Daniel and recalling these things because, folks, we indeed live in those latter days of which King Nebuchadnezzar's dream spoke. We're in those days. And it has much to do with the kingdom that Jesus brought into the world. And it has much to do with His church of which we are a part. So Daniel then revealed the details of the king's dream. What were they? Well, in the dream, he says, King, you saw, this is what you saw. You saw a great image, a massive image statue basically its head was made of gold its chest and arms of silver its belly and thighs of bronze its legs of iron and then its feet were partly iron and partly clay well for whatever reason this image, this dream, frightened King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on earth, greatly. So it was fearsome, not just awesome. And, and as he beheld it, Daniel, relaying the details back to the king, says there was a stone that was cut out of a mountain and was thrown against the image striking it in its feet and shattering them into pieces. And then it says that 
that the, the entire image collapsed into dust, in effect. It's destroyed. But the stone remained. And it became a great mountain, and it says it filled the earth, the entire earth. So this was the dream that, that scared the king to death. You may say, I've had scarier dreams than that. But this really shook this great man. And, and it nearly led to the deaths of an entire class of people, uh, the wise men, the magicians of Babylon, who all failed the king's request to uh, reveal the dream and interpret it until, of course, Daniel saved the day. Then Daniel, starting in chapter 2, verse 26, gives the interpretation of the dream. He said, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. He says, after you will come a, a less great kingdom than yours. Represented in the dream by the silver, you see. And then will come another after them, shown by the bronze. And then there will be a fourth kingdom of iron. Very, very strong that will dominate and rule and will crush to pieces all that oppose it. But the feet, very important, the feet are this combination of, of strength and weakness. Um, you've got iron, but you've got clay mixed in. And, and so the fourth kingdom, though it dominates and it's fearsome and so forth, it clearly has its weaknesses and its vulnerabilities. Now, it, interpreting what all those images of the dream mean might seem almost as intimidating to us as it was to those Babylonian wise men. But, um, you know, we have the benefit of hindsight and, and history, and we have, more importantly, the scriptures to serve as a guide in understanding what seems clear is that this dream lays out history from the days of Daniel to the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, at least as it concerns the great kingdoms of the world that would come along. So um, the first is clearly Babylon, represented by the head of gold, whose king in Daniel's day was, was obviously Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, he's the guy that was afflicted with this terrible prophetic dream. So we begin there. The kingdom that came next after Babylon was Persia. And then came the Greeks after them. Um, from your history books, you'll You'll remember the greatest leader of the Greeks being Alexander, Alexander the Great. And then the kingdom that arose next was the one of iron in, in the dream, which brings us really to the time of Jesus. And, and this would be the Romans, the great and mighty kingdom which ruled the world with sort of an iron fist, but also had feet of clay. And then we come to verse 44, Daniel chapter 2. I really said all of that today to get to this verse. But I didn't want to just jump to this verse, okay? Daniel 2, verse 44. This is where we learn what that rock was in the dream. Here's what the text says. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever just as you saw 
that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. God says, summing all this up now, in the days of the Romans, I'll set up a new kingdom which will never be destroyed. How did Jesus say it? He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, 600 years after this dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar and and it was interpreted, things begin to happen. John the Baptist appears out in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And very soon after that, Jesus himself comes and he says the very same thing. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then after all the important events of the gospel were accomplished, the the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and his ascension, to the right hand of the Father on high, the kingdom in the form of the church comes in power as foretold by this same Jesus. It comes in power on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. You can read all about that in Acts chapter 2. 3,000 people are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ that day as the gospel is preached publicly for the first time. And that great chapter, chapter 2 of Acts, concludes with the following famous words. Verse 47, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, What have we done today in this survey? You may be wondering. We have shown the kingdom, the church, in prophecy. We have shown the attitude for ministry in the church. In Jesus' words, for example, in in Matthew chapter 20, where he said there there are not going to be any earthly kings, Not going to be earthly rulers in this kingdom. But the great ones are servants. The greatest ones are servants. And that, in fact, everybody in this kingdom is a servant. A minister. Diakonos. What we've not done yet, but we'll attempt to do next time, Lord willing, is is show how God has organized this. How has he organized ministry in his church? He has done so by giving it offices, for lack of a better term. Offices or officers. Um, Different roles. With different gifts and abilities designed to help lead and carry out the ministry of the church. Now, some of those roles and gifts that he gave were temporary. For instance, he gave the church apostles. He gave the church prophets. He gave the church in the first century workers of miracles and things like that. Some of those things were temporary by God's choice and design. But then some and many remain until today in God's wisdom. And so we have teachers 
and we have deacons, and we have elders, and we have evangelists, and things like that, and other gifts. All of them, though, you see, being servants and, and ministers in the kingdom, because everybody is that. Before we talk about any of these offices or officers, and I know that's an inadequate word, I'm just using it to try to describe. Before we talk about those things, we need to start with the idea that we're talking about servants. And if you're not a servant, you can't be any of those things. The ministry of the church is so important. It was conceived and created and designed by the same God who sent King Nebuchadnezzar that troublesome dream all those years ago and then sent Daniel to help him to, to interpret. And the same God said it very clearly in his word, here's what I want you to do in my church. Well, I hope you look forward to this study as we go a little bit further in it in coming weeks and as we prepare ourselves to um, make some important decisions and choices amongst us in coming weeks. Thank you for listening this morning. Let's pray. Dear God, you are so good to us. You've just blessed us this morning uh, by giving us time to worship and be together, by using the talents of those uh, that have been before us today. Thank you for that. We pray we've honored your name, and we thank you for your word, and we pray that we have handled it aright in these few moments, and that more importantly, we'll, we will go and continue to use it with wisdom to work in your kingdom. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. Uh, we come to you in his name today. Amen. This morning as we close, we're going to sing again. And if you have spiritual need or, or any need this morning that we can minister to, we want to do that before we go. If we can pray with you, help you. If you're ready today to confess faith in Christ and, and be immersed in his name, as we made reference to uh, through the course of our lesson, well, we'd really celebrate to see that. If you have questions about things and, and need help and guidance and study, please let us know. That's what we're about. So if we can help you this morning before we go, please come while we stand and sing this song.